driving out like way out like an hour outside of town at 2 a.m. in a blizzard to go do a uterine prolapse and I get there and she's not caught and so we end up stretching her between an ATV and a truck <laughs> with toe straps and I'm just like this like nobody teaches you this in vet school <laughs> this is never in the curriculum like how to survive this situation These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. This episode of the Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by DECT. That's D-E-C-K-E-D. If you don't know what that is, DECT is a drawer system that goes in the bed of a pickup truck or a van, and it'll fit just about any American-made pickup truck or van. It's a flat surface on top, and then underneath, there are two drawers that slide out that you can put your gear in, and it's going to be completely weatherproof, so I've never had snow or rain or anything get in there. There's also a bunch of organizational features like the deco line, And there's boxes that you can put rifles or bows or tools, all different sizes. There's some bags and toolkits. There's a bunch of different stuff that you can put in there. But the biggest thing is you can take the stuff that's in your back seat out of your back seat and store it in the drawer system and it's secure. You can put a huge payload of a couple thousand pounds on top of this deck drawer system. There's tie downs on it so you can strap down all your coolers and your four wheeler and whatever else you've got up there. It's good stuff. This is made out of all recycled material that's 100% manufactured in America. And if you go to decked.com slash six ranch, you'll get free shipping on anything that you order. This show is possible because companies like Decked sponsor it. And I would highly encourage you to support this American made business and get yourself some good gear. Thank you so much for doing this. This is Adele Shaw. I'm James Nash's little sister. He uh, let me take over the podcast today. And I invited Brooke Hoffman here because I, Brooke, I think your story is so cool. One, I relate to a lot just because you grew up here, Mm -hmm. left here, and chose to come back here Mm -hmm. after having gained skills and assets that could contribute to this community Mm -hmm. and I think that so many of us little girls growing up loving animals were thinking oh I'll just become a vet Mm -hmm. because that's what I want to do forever is be around animals and I know for me I said that and then I looked at vet school and I was like "Mm, maybe I'll stick to ranching (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you could be maybe making more money and working a little less somewhere else. And you chose to come back anyways. And I think for all those little girls who have those big dreams of becoming a vet and still having a family and still choosing to be in a place and doing a thing that they love, you did that. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe start with just growing up here and your dad who we had on the podcast before Mm -hmm. was a vet Mm -hmm. and you still chose to become a vet (laughs) and just kind of start there like growing up here and what that was like yeah thank you so much for having me it's so fun to be here yeah so I guess I yeah I was born and raised here in the county and obviously spent a lot of time at the vet clinic like you mentioned because my dad is also a veterinarian here um, who I have the pleasure of working with which not many can say I guess the pleasure and the working with their dad (laughs) part (laughs) so yeah I was born and raised here and we know was involved in everything 4-H FFA sports all of that jazz and then I always wanted to come back I never thought I would go anywhere else which is a little bit different I think and was kind of reassuring Um, I'll get to it later but I I had some thoughts about going somewhere else for a little bit but always knew I wanted to come home eventually I loved growing up here Uh, my family has a little bit of property outside of town so you know grew up on a farm and my dad and I spent a lot of time together, like hiking and packing in the back country. And then uh, we're both archery hunters. So we do that together. And um, so the county always, you know, was 
like everything I ever wanted to do is here. I remember my brother asked why I wanted to come back here because he was just shocked that I would want to come back because he did not. And I told him, where else would I go? Everything I like to do is here. <laughs> but it was really fun. I really enjoyed growing up here and it was really hard to leave to go to college, but I always knew I wanted to be a vet. Um, so when I graduated from high school, I went to Oregon State for both undergrad and vet school. And I really loved it there. Actually, it's a pretty small town for a, as big of a university as it is. Um, definitely a lot bigger than here, <laughs> but still relatively small. Um, and I love it's you know it's like originally an ag community, and so it felt like you know there was a there's a big ag presence there, which I really liked. So that was a little nicer transition for me. So I did a degree in animal science um, with a pre vet option, and did that in college, and then decided I got in a couple places for vet school and decided to stay where I was because I had um, a church community and like local community that I'd kind of built there and I felt really good um, about staying so I and it's the smallest at at the time it was the smallest vet school class size in the country which I really liked (laughs) I really liked this how small Um, there were like 56 in my class I think so we're a pretty small group so I went through vet school and then like you said it was very you know they weed you out every year like leading up to vet school because it's very popular everybody wants to be a vet at one point or another Um, and then the either the tuition or the length of schooling (laughs) seems like it gets people at some point or another Um, or it's just super competitive so just being able to get in is hard so I did that which was very challenging vet school is very hard and then I so I graduated during COVID, which was very exciting. It actually worked out in my favor in the end, but it was I had been kind of debating whether or not, you know, everybody tells you to go somewhere else first to practice. But I just really felt like, you know, the community was really excited to have me back and I was really ready to be home. Um, So I decided to come home, which worked out great because of COVID. So it would have been a lot more stressful to go somewhere else. But I came back then. So that was about four years ago. I graduated and moved home. Um, And yeah, I went to work with my dad and then his business partner. So there's three of us there at the clinic. Um, And that is that's been so great. Those guys are such awesome mentors and they just love their job, which is hard to find in the vet world these days. There's a lot of vets that are really unhappy with their, you know, either their job or where they're at. And so it's nice to work with people that really enjoy it um, because you just don't see it as much anymore. And you are correct. um, The timing wise with um, vets are, it's a lot easier and I don't know about easier, if that's the right word, but it's, you, I would make a lot more money and I would have a lot more time off if I worked in a bigger city. So that was definitely a choice coming back here. Um, so we are a mixed animal practice, truly. So every day is really different. Like today I had dogs and horses and a rabbit. And <laughs> so you never know what's going to come in and it's calving season. So you really never know which is fun, but also, you know, we need to provide an emergency service for our clients and the nearest referral hospital is like three to four hours away. Um, So that's just not an option here. A lot of clinics have started doing that where, you know, your general GP practices will close down um, and then just have an emergency center close by, but that's not an option here. So, and that's really important to our clients, obviously, to be able to call when they have an emergency. So yeah, that's kind of my my story a little bit, and it's I really do enjoy. I, my dad was a big um, advocate for me to keep going to vet school because there's a lot of times you want to quit because it's so hard, and then for me to come back here, he worked really hard to get me back here because he really wanted to work with me, and so I'm thankful for that because I really love it and I'm really happy to be home, and I really can't imagine being anywhere else. Yeah. Do you want to tell us maybe one of those times during vet school? Because I think it's easy to imagine that that's really hard. But I mean, you're basically becoming a doctor, Mm -hmm. right? So I think a lot of people are really familiar with maybe some of those schedules and demands of going to med school. Mm -hmm. But do you want to talk about maybe one of those times in vet school when you're like, this is crazy and how many of those 56 people that you started with did they actually all graduate yeah not everybody I started with graduated um 
but they would um at least in like the first year they would fill that spot first year or two I think they would fill it so I'm not sure I think we ended up graduating it was kind of hard they get students from other um, schools that come in and do their clinicals with us I'm actually not sure the number we graduate we also didn't have a graduation so it's a little tricky <laughs> Oh, because of COVID? Thanks, COVID, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think we were pretty close to that number. Um, we didn't, you, we lost a, a, maybe a couple of students like the first year or two. And then after that, everybody stayed, which was nice. You hope that the weed out process is pretty much done in vet school. You know, everybody's made it that far. And so it was nice. Most people made it. As far as a time, I mean, it was probably like an every week occurrence <laughs> as far as vet school is really, it is, it's medical school essentially. They say, I don't want to say it's more challenging than medical school. I think it's just really different. But you're learning for not every species, but, you know, most species. So definitely dogs, cats, horses, cattle. And then they throw like sheep and goats are getting more popular. And we learn about those too. And then you do cover like exotics and some other species as well, just not nearly as much. So you're, you know, and even a cat and a dog are significantly different from each other completely different illnesses how you treat them all that so just the that's just a huge volume of information you're covering in vet school and so the first three years are so I did four years of undergrad which is pretty typical and then you know in that time got all the prereqs required I got my bachelor's degree but then also got my prereqs for vet school and then once I was in vet school the first three years are like classwork pretty much third year they kind of start to throw you into some like sort of clinicals a little bit and then fourth year I mean like a full calendar year is clinical so you don't get the summer off you do a full year of clinicals which is like electives required clinicals like large animal surgery or small animal medicine or whatever and then um, also your like internships that you choose to do so it's kind of a mixed bag and you're all over the place and stressed all the time but it's super fun because you're actually doing things that you learned (laughs) for the first three years but I feel like that was the hardest part is you're just I mean you're learning so many different things all at once and you learn it at such a deep knowledge, you know, they say that you lose a lot of what you learn just because once you get out onto practice, it's a lot more like practical in general. You're not seeing a lot of, they call like zebra diseases, you know, like the crazies that you're only going to see maybe once in your life. Where in vet school, they cover all of it for all species, maybe even ones you're not going to see. And so it's just a lot of like, you're just studying all the time and taking exams all the time. So it's a like, you know, stressful like any graduate program but just a huge amount of species differences which makes it a little extra challenging yeah I I would (laughs) say that's a little extra challenging (laughs) what is an animal that you got to work on that would surprise us um probably a I thought the guinea pig was odd (laughs) or a hedgehog I saw a hedgehog one time (laughs) Yeah. What was wrong with the hedgehog? I think it just needed its nails trimmed. <laughs> it wasn't very, everyone was very excited about it because we just don't see hedgehogs. <laughs> uh, right. Because you also do that, right? It's also like teeth cleaning, nail trimming. Oh, yeah. Just... All kinds of preventative things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the species, um, but obviously for any of them, what you prefer is like preventative medicine if you can do it. So like vaccines and wellnesses, things like that, Mm -hmm. that's across the board. But then obviously a lot of what we do is is things that go wrong or emergencies or whatever, um, which is going to happen no matter what. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I loved what you said. Um, I think I think I can speak for anybody in this community that we have incredible vets that mm-hmm. um, you guys are as a team, they're so incredibly educated and, you know, knowledgeable and the skill set is so high. And yet what I think is really amazing is just the level of compassion. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's been several different times, even for me that I can think of calling one of you knowing that you're taking that call without a billable hour Mm -hmm. in place and um, you can either be reassuring, ask all the right questions, um, help me through. I I know at one point your dad, I just had a cow that wouldn't get up, Mm -hmm. right? And he gives 
to be able to take that call, stay present with me, help me through that situation to know if that cow's okay, is it okay to flip her over, right? Is it okay to roll her? Like, how am I going to do the least amount of harm mm-hmm. here if it is a West Nile situation or a tick down or something like that, mm-hmm. or if this cow just fell down and hurt herself, mm-hmm. right? And just having those relationships is what I think is so special about coming back to your community, right? Mm-hmm. You talked about not wanting to leave school because you had built that community there Mm -hmm. and coming back home. I know for me, it was just this big sigh of relief Mm -hmm. of family and community. And that makes everything easier. Yes. I think. And I just, I know for me, I really, really value that, that there is such an honest and compassionate relationship Mm -hmm in our vet clinic Mm -hmm. and you're the next generation of that Mm -hmm. which is pretty incredible I tell people that all the time I was just talking to a vet student about it it's like you know you're going to make mistakes in they call it practice for a reason and it's inevitable that it's going to happen but your reaction is huge like in this community you know you hope and I have seen it over and over with whatever the situation but they know that you're out to like do what's best for them you know like no like nobody thinks I'm out to get them or their animal and I think that you know accountability but also like on both sides but also just what you're saying like you guys know that we care about you and your animal so much and that knowledge just sets such a great foundation for everything else whereas if you're in a place where you don't know the client or the vet either direction then it's a lot harder to trust that they know what they're talking about or like on my end is the client like understanding what I'm saying do they are they going to listen to what I'm telling them are they going to turn around and sue me you know that's just not something that we deal with here um, which is really a privilege in this world today because it's has changed the dynamic has changed quite a bit and so it's kind of twofold I think you know, the culture at our clinic, I think is just amazing. It's really something you don't find very often in a lot of places. I can say that now going out and working in a lot of different places. And, you know, there's, there's great spots, but I do think that, like I said, all of us really love what we do um, and enjoy going to work, which is something that can't always be said. And then also, you know, like our employees right now are just awesome. And we, we've had, we've been blessed with great employees for a long time but it it is like a family. And so it's nice to have that dynamic. And then on top of that, I feel like the community is that way as well. You know, this community is just so incredible the way they wrap around people that need it and support each other, um, you know, support us as a business, all kinds of things. Um, And so we, I don't think any of us have any problem with like what you're talking about, where you call us and we don't even have a visit. We're not charging you anything for that but you're a great client and we you know we know that you're going to use us for things and we're happy to help you when you need help um, and not necessarily see anything we can just kind of talk you through it and you know we have that knowledge to share and I think in a community like this that's such an important part is to know that you can do that and we people all the time thank me for that They're, they're just you know thank you so much for taking my call I really appreciate it I think people are understand that that's not you know something that you can do everywhere. I mean, a lot of places I've gone, people, I mean, I've had job offers everywhere because people are just desperate, specifically for large animal vets. Um, I'd say maybe especially cattle work. Um, There's a huge need for that all over the place. Um, I've been some in some counties that don't have a single vet anywhere. So they're driving like four hours to the nearest vet, um, which is just wild compared to here. So like you said, we've had a history for a long time. I mean, Mike started this practice, you know, quite a while ago. And it's there's been good vets the whole time. And that is rare to have that in such a rural place. Um, and to be able to call and know you're getting somebody that knows what they're doing. And also, like you were talking about, just is compassionate and can provide that service. Because a lot of places don't have it at all. And I think we're going to, it's going to become more and more of a problem. You know, my class was probably 90% small animal. 
focus. So there was only a few of us that ended up going into either mixed or like large animals specifically, usually equine. Um, and then some of those have already switched into small animal, which has been a big trend just across the board in the industry. So it's getting harder and harder to find one people who will go to a rural area and work emergency. And then two people who will do large animal at all. Um, it's just not, it's not an easy job. So a lot of people don't like to do it. Um, which I can't blame them. It is, it's physically demanding. And then like we were talking about earlier, the emergency call is definitely a big toll on people. And so, um, but it's going to become a, a big, it already is a pretty big problem and it's going to get a lot worse. That's interesting. Do you think, I mean, you named a couple great reasons there why that's happening. Mm-hmm. Is there, is there anything else there? Do you think that it's intimidating to work on larger animals? Do you feel like it's more about money and where people can live and kind of the less lesser demand and I'm also curious in that if you, you obviously had a dad who would have never said, you know, you're not physically capable right. of being a large animal vet. Right. Um, but do you think that maybe that's still a story out there that you need to be this large man to be able to work with cattle and horses and larger critters? Mm-hmm. Great questions. I like this. Yeah. (laughs) So I think it's a combo of all of it. So the shift, like I talked about in the small animal, like most people going into small animal is true. um, But also it's mostly female dominant now. So I like to compare. So like when Dave went to school, Dave is my dad's business partner. um, He was I think it was like 80% men at that time when my dad went to school it was like 50 50 men women and then when I went it was I would say 80 to 90% women Um, and so the shift has been huge over the years in the vet world and I don't know I've heard a lot of different commentary on that and I still am not exactly sure why I've heard from the admissions folks that it's actually there's just way fewer men applying to vet school so it's not like they're just selecting women over men in the application process it's like men are just not applying like they used to so I'm not sure I can't seem to figure out there doesn't seem to be a really good reason why that is but that is the trend that we're seeing um and so I think like I said the you know the lifestyle as far as the emergency call is part of it um the money factor is definitely part of it you know by the like if you look at just time spent with like a dog versus a cow, the business makes a lot more money a lot faster on the small animal side versus the large animal. It's just the economics of it. Like we cannot charge, nobody could afford if we charge the same rate. It's just not how it, that's just not fair. So business wise, a lot of people have stopped providing large animal services, even as a business, because it's just not as economic, economical for the business. Um, and then I think that there is a big, like you said, I grew up in like such a different mindset. My dad always encouraged, like he, I think he had more faith in me than I did for most of my like, you know, schooling years, which was so nice to have because a lot of people don't have that. Um, and especially, you know, I grew up in this community, so I feel like I had a fair amount of cattle practice. I didn't grow up on a ranch. Um, I actually didn't develop, I really love working with cattle now, but I didn't develop that till I went to college, which is a little odd. I wish I would have gotten it sooner because I could have had some more hands-on experience when I was younger, but it's just, I did a lot of horse things. Um, so I felt pretty good with horses, but working with cattle is a whole different ball game. And if you don't grow up in it, it's kind of hard to get a foot in the door just in general. Um, and in the vet world, you can get the experience, but it is still hard and you have to work for it. Um, especially a lot of vet schools just don't focus on it anymore. At least ours, like up in the Northwest, you know, it's not exactly a hot commodity, the cattle industry. So it's not as focused on in our side, probably honestly, probably this whole half of the country, I would say. Um, and so you really had to seek out experiences. So like in undergrad, I did, um, like reproductive palpation. Then I actually got most of my experience. Then I was like, hardly got any in vet school. Um, so I got most of my practice. Then I got AI certified. I did a bunch of stuff just in undergrad, just cause I really liked it. Um, and then, in vet school, I sought out that because I really enjoyed cattle and I knew I was going to do it when I got home. So I looked for that experience, but it's really hard. I talked to the, it's so different. So like when Dr. Dave went to school, 
it was like a huge percentage of cattle work that they did. So he got a lot better experience even just in school than I did. So he'll ask me, he's like, well, didn't you learn that in school? And I'm like, no, Dave, I learned it from you guys. You know, we just didn't get that experience like you did. And so I think that's hard too, is you're not, even if you know you need it, you're not necessarily getting the, the same level of experience as you used to just because it's not as popular anymore or not as needed anymore. And then I do think that you know, women coming out into it. There is a stigma, even in this county, I'd say I'm really blessed here. There are, I mean, the ranchers are some of my biggest cheerleaders here, which is so cool to see. I really appreciate that. Cause I know like <laughs> just across the board, everybody here has known me since I was a toddler, you know? <laughs> so like literally since I was a baby. So it's gotta be so hard for some people to see me and they're like, you're a doctor now, <laughs> like you're working on it. What is happening? You know, it's got to, I just can't even imagine. And so I don't blame people when they are skeptical because I cannot even imagine that's gotta be just mind blowing to them just to see that you know, yeah. transition. You're always 17 in your hometown. Oh right? my gosh, forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I would say people have overall, I mean, I've definitely run into some that have an issue, but overall that's always the case when you're the new person anywhere. Right. So it's not, not a huge surprise, but coming back home, everybody has been really supportive. And I think a lot of people are just thankful I would come home because they know that it's hard to find vets that'll do it anymore. And, and they trust me. They know that I'm, they know me from when I was young. So even though I'm young, they know that I'll, you know, I'm out to help them and, and do my best. So that's really helpful, but it is hard and even like I said, I, you know, I, I told you all these things that I tried to do to get experience. The cattle work is some of the hardest to get experience. And just because, you know, I, do, I see so many small animals and the cattle work is so seasonal here because we are, you know, cow calf. And so everything is on a season, unlike a dairy where you're doing the same thing year round. So it's a little, I, I don't know, again, it's not easier. It's just that you see it all the time. So it's a little bit more comfortable. And so for me, it's like, you know, we have calving season and it's gone and you're probably not going to see another calving. You might get one or two, but you're probably not going to see it until next season. And then people have improved so much that calving season is a lot more mild than it used to be anyway, just because of genetics um, and how people manage. But um, so it is really it is really challenging. I You know, it's not true everywhere. There's certain parts of the country, obviously, that are really heavy in, in the cattle industry, but but for here, um, you know, I, last year I went to a couple different conferences. Um, I went to one in Ohio and one in Tennessee, and they're both cattle focused um, and, and, and for vets. Um, and that was really neat to go just be with people who <laughs> most of them were actually like large animal only. Some of them are cattle only. And so I felt a little out of my wheelhouse, but it was cool to see. Um, you know, I felt really comfortable. I could have taught the class I took on on um, preg checking. So that was really cool to see, you know, like our little corner of Oregon. Like we actually do see quite a bit of cattle here, which is really nice to know because the Northwest is not exactly known for for our cattle yeah. countrywide. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that it might be true that a lot of people don't know how much beef actually gets produced in this little corner of the state. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you think of it as, you know, it is challenging the mm -hmm. terrain here and the season here. But when we have grass, it's the very best. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. I took some of some hay samples from the county with me on one because it was a nutrition course for cow calf operations. And they were hugely impressed by our hay. They could not believe that that was our hay. And then they also couldn't believe the price of hay. In the yeah. County. Yeah. So it was kind of a mix, but yeah, it's interesting to see. Well, and just to talk to people about how they run cattle so differently across the country. I mean, we don't have byproducts here like a right. lot of places do. And that is, I mean, some places that's like all they feed their cows most of the year. Right. And that's just wildly different than here. I'm like, we can't even, I mean, it's probably cost more to get those shipped in here than it would be than you're saving on other feed products. So exactly. Huge yeah. differences. The isolation really limits our ability to um, sell in kind of its highest valuable form, mm -hmm. right? Or to get cheap products in mm -hmm. uh, just really we don't have the the processing around here mm -hmm. the emergency call part has to be so challenging and like you said you were willing to take that on mm -hmm. when you were growing up and seeing that I heard you say right away like that you and your dad spent time in the backcountry mm -hmm. and you you know got to go hunting and things like that and sometimes when I 
look at peers who are resistant to go into ranching because their story is they saw their parents just work themselves to death. Mm -hmm. And in some ways they're, they look at that as misery and, you know, they're like, why would I ever want to do that? Right. And I'm curious to hear your perspective of growing up because what I witnessed was my family who loved the work. Mm -hmm. So even though there was a lot of it, it was work that we enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. But we also took breaks. Like we spent time at the lake. We used to water ski a lot. We team roped like two nights a week. Mm -hmm. Um, We took vacations. We took time to be together as a family outside of work. And I think that that really gave me a foundation to come back to ranching, knowing it was going to be a lot of work, Mm -hmm. but also knowing that I could balance that out. Did you have the same experience? Yeah, for sure. So I, I used to love to go on emergencies with my dad. (laughs) It was my, we actually talk about it a lot now because sometimes we'll come in and help each other on emergency and we love it because we just don't get to do it anymore like we used to. (laughs) And so I loved doing that with him. I loved going into the clinic and spending time on whatever. And I think, and he loved it too. It was so fun, I think, for him to have me go along with him. And so, and then, like I said, I just, I've met few people more passionate about their job than my dad. And so to have that as like that, you know, he was who I looked up to growing up and spent time with. And that's just such a healthy perspective in your job and your life. Um, But then my family was the same. We traveled a lot growing up. And so every year we would do a vacation somewhere. We usually did like a fifth wheel trip to somewhere in the country. But I mean, we went as far as like the Badlands. So it was like not limited (laughs) to the Northwest. So, you know, I've been to like most of the national parks, this side of the country. We also went to Europe one summer. You know, we were pretty well traveled. Um, which is a little bit unique, I think, for kids from the county. They don't always have that experience. Um, And I just recently told them that um, because I had the opportunity to take um, some of my family that haven't got the chance to travel to a place that they'd never been and they haven't really got to go hardly anywhere. And just to see that perspective from them and to know like how blessed I was growing up and getting all the traveling we did, I think that, like you were saying, it's just such a healthy lifestyle you know you don't necessarily have to go far or do a lot but just to have that balance where you're not always working whatever that looks like whether that's ranching or our world and the vet world to have a mix and like for me right now it's funny because my husband does work in ranching he's a cowboy and so my breaks are a lot of times ranching now (laughs) that's what I go do for fun and I you know I go to work with him and I love it because I get to go not talk to people for a day and he's always lonely because he's always out by himself so he always wants to go to dinner or something where he can chat with people so we have this little bit of disconnect (laughs) but you know I spend my whole day talking to people and so I love the break to get to go out and just be outside and and with the horses or cows or whatever we're doing that day I really enjoy it so it's kind of fun but I don't I think no matter what it is like have a hobby and go do that I think in any job that's so important and then especially in an isolated place like this you know there is a big world outside of this county and it's really easy to just like put blinders on and headphones on and just ignore everything going on because we can do that here we're pretty isolated but it's not really the reality. And it's, I think it's also healthy. You know, I've traveled to, I did a vet trip to Uganda. um, And then, you know, I did a a mission trip early in life to Mexico. And I think some of that's some healthy perspective, because that is just such a huge contrast to here. You know, we have poverty here, but it's just not at the same level. Um, And so that's a good way to also put your life into a little bit of a different perspective um, and remind yourself that, you know, we have a, we have a pretty awesome life here and, and we're, we're blessed to be able to just, it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of an old, it's an old school life. I feel like it's a little bit traditional and, and that's why we love it. You know, we get to ignore some of that stuff, but it's important to, to keep it in mind. Yeah. I, I could not agree more. Um, I give a lot of credit to, um, going on exchange in high mm-hmm. school. Right. And, and that I think it's one of the most important things. And I acknowledge too, that I was really lucky to mm-hmm. have a family who let me and supported me yeah. doing that when I was younger so that I carried that forward into my adult life to travel and see other things and experience other places. Oh yeah, And 
yeah leave here to know what it really is to be here right is is so important and I think that um like you said it it really gives you that perspective of how lucky we are Mm -hmm. um to not only live in this county but to live in this country right all of the things that it's really easy to take for granted right if you don't do that and I found uh, I didn't know that I always wanted to come home. Mm-hmm. There was times when I thought maybe not. But at the same time, I always had a home. So it was really easy to travel without this, like, I'm searching for my place in the world. Mm-hmm. Just traveling to see and experience new things. And I think I was really lucky for that, mm-hmm. too. Yeah, I definitely think... Yeah, you. I, I think a lot of people, especially now, isn't that the trend? Like a lot of people are just out looking for something. It seems like it. And they like can't it. find it. Yeah. Yeah it's, yeah. That, it's that community, family, and home that we, we're so rich in. Mm-hmm. And I think for so many people, it's really hard to find. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's true. And yeah, we have that. I mean, it, like you said, a lot of people, even people who want to leave and don't necessarily know if they'll come back, they know they have a home here. And it just feels like it. I was just talking to a friend who's back in town and he's been off at school and doesn't, I don't know that he'll move back here either, but he's like, man, it's, it feels good to be home. You know, mm-hmm. like it's just, it's just, it is, it's just a really nice feeling to have that like grounded place you can come back to. Yeah. It's a big word. Home is, yeah. a, is a really big word. It and is. That feels good. And that being said, you know, like we touched on a little bit earlier, there's easier places to mm-hmm. be, right? Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear some stories on that of the challenges of being a vet <laughs> here. Um, I definitely know there's challenges of, you know, your husband being a cowboy here. He runs in the canyons in some really steep country. Mm-hmm. But you're going out to ranches <laughs> on every corner of this county, too. Um, have there been any, like epic tales there I already have so many which is crazy (laughs) I've only been out four years and I feel like I could already write a book but yeah I mean I love it I love like I feel like I drive places and I know so many like oh this person lives here I've been to that ranch I've gone here you know you you start to get a feel because you just do it enough you know we're usually out at most ranches at least pregging or semen testing you know, some, depending on the ranch, sometimes several times a year, it depends on, you know, what they do, but it's really fun because everybody does it a little different. It doesn't mean it's wrong. You know, you know this in ranching, everybody has an opinion (laughs) on what's the best way to do things, but it's true. I mean, everybody has to do it a little bit different. Um, just, and I talked to them about that. It's like, well, you, you're not, that's not how you're running this ranch. You know, you're, that you're, uh, you're out on permits. That's not, you're not on irrigated pasture all year. You're not going to get those numbers you're looking for because that's just not how it, it goes when you're, when you're ranching like that, you know? And so it's so fun to get to go see how people do things differently sometimes less fun sometimes you get somewhere where it feels very dangerous like the shoot really they really need to upgrade the shoot just for the safety of all involved um but it's still fun I mean yeah I'm out working in shoots that have been there you know long before Dave was born you know (laughs) let alone me um but it's so fun I have yeah oh man especially this time of year it's calving season so I have some you know like going driving out like way out like an hour outside of town at 2 a.m. in a blizzard to go do a uterine prolapse and I get there and she's not caught so we end up stretching her between an ATV and a truck (laughs) with toe straps and I'm just like this like nobody teaches you this in vet school (laughs) this is never in the curriculum like how to survive the situation and uh But you just do it. And, like, that's the thing. My favorite quote during calving season, I always tell anybody I'm working with, it's calving season is a team sport. And, like, you're going to have to get, like, we're all involved here. (laughs) Which is so true, like, whether it's a prolapse or the calving, you know, like, and cows are just that way in general, right? Like, it's just, you got to have everybody on board. But I love that. Like, I think that's why I like working with the cattle so much is that, you know, you're expected to do your job and then I'm expecting them to do theirs, right? So I'm going to show up and I expect them to be ready to get rolling. And if not, like maybe give me a call ahead of time. And then they're expecting me to keep rolling and let them know if I'm not going to be able to or whatever it is. And we're all doing it together. We're all working like a team. And I really like that part of it because you're all relying on each other. And then you stand around chatting for half an hour when you're done. And that's just like not, you know, that's not a normal thing in a lot of places because that's like, you know, 
wasted time, quote unquote, but I don't think it is at all. You know, you're building relationships with these people and they're some of my favorite people, you know, like you're, you're there at two in the morning in the middle of a blizzard and you're just like, why do we do this? Why? <laughs> why are we or like i had to do a c-section on a cow down in a trailer like he hauled it to the clinic we couldn't get her up she was paralyzed in the back end and it's like what do you do like you can only do the best you can with the situation you're given in any (laughs) any time ranching in general in the vet world in general like it's just oh man and so you know she lived she lived through that but the whole time i was telling him i'm like she is going to die like there is literally no way this none of this is good like this whole situation is so bad but it is what it is you know like you just have to deal with it and yeah she made it which i never would have never would have bet money on her but oh man they're so cattle especially you have there's so many good ones because you know you they're they always put themselves in those situations where you're like what are we why are we in the middle of a pond right now how did we get here (laughs) why did we get here (laughs) oh my gosh yeah but i it makes for some really good stories later they really is horrible in the moment (laughs) really yeah yeah i hope you write a book i think that would be i think that would be epic that's awesome. I want to circle back really quickly mm-hmm. um, because I didn't mean to miss it, but what was Uganda like? Oh, yeah. So it was actually just before COVID. It was like January of 2020. I went to Uganda for two weeks and it was kind of an odd one. It was a, it was like a separate trip. It wasn't actually like through a vet program or anything, but it, I traveled. It was actually with a, a vet in her church. So we went over there and we were, um, so it was like a mission vet trip. So we did like a rabies clinic where we rabies vaccinated a bunch of um, dogs there. Um, and then we did some spay neuter clinics. Um, and so we were just spaying and neutering a bunch of their their pets. I mean, they're, it's really different, obviously, standards than what we have here. Um, but they just do not have vet care there at all really they have some but it's really limited and so we did some spade eater clinics they're just out on a table out like on this deck in the middle of Uganda it's very dirty nothing like here very different standards Um, but that was really fun so it was me and that that vet who traveled over there and then then her daughter who's my friend um, and she has been a vet tech for a long time and she's actually an EMT as well but um, so she did a lot of the tech work and then her mom and I did um, a lot of the like spay neuter and then all I, and then we did like I said rabies and then we would kind of see some other things and then we got to go work with livestock which was super fun um, they have some really different cattle over there compared to here um, they have some of the zebu which we do have some of um, and then they have the oncole which I had never seen before they're really interesting I'll have to look them up they have what really are those like they're they're similar to zebu they're kind of that like boss indicus type cow mm-hmm. Um, but they have these really tall horns. They're really unique. Um, I've never seen anything like it before. And so, but they're kind of similar to the zebu. So we got to go out. And so the thing about Uganda is, especially rural Uganda, um, you have to wear skirts if you wear, if your knees are showing. So if you wear pants or your shirt, if your skirt is too short, it's considered offensive or kind of offensive. And so we, it was my first time working cattle in skirts. <laughs> that was really interesting. And sandals, actually. I was wearing my keen sandals, but that was so fun. It's very, obviously, pretty much everything they do is completely different than here. So they have alleyways, but no shoots. And the alleyways are, you know, pretty precarious. But what they do is they just shove the alley full and work them down the alley. Um, and then even like their handling. So the cattle are a lot smaller than here. So they like hold the mouth when they're trying to hold. So like the, these guys were like tribal members. It was pretty remote. Um, they would come and like hold for you. So I'd be giving shots or. So just with their hand, they just yeah, grab a hold like of the Yeah, like the lip. bottom jaw. No, the bottom jaw. The bottom jaw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they warned the vet we were out. So we went to Uganda and we worked with a vet who's been there for 30 years. She's lived there. Um, and so she works with the people there, which was really neat to work with somebody who's that well established. Um, and so she was warning me ahead of time about some of these. She's like, just so you know, like they do things really differently. So like, don't tell them not to do it. Like that's how they know how to do it and so yeah we are obviously we brought some stuff with us over there and then she has access to some there Um, but you're obviously very limited on treatment the diseases there are really different than we have here there's some that are the same but in general they're pretty different so that was really 
cool to see and then just to get get to experience i mean that is it is wildly different than here so getting to experience that was really neat um and then on the other part of it we went and we started churches there too we were helping with some churches they'd recently planted way way out in remote villages um and that was they are just such a joyful people so they are like huge pranksters jokesters they like love to make people laugh so that was so fun and then like their worship is like everybody's dancing and singing like it's so different than here um and so i learned a lot from them like all across the board it was really really neat to go experience that um so yeah, we did that for two weeks and it's very different. <laughs> it's very rugged living in that time because we were out, you know, the cities aren't like that. They're well established, but we were not spending a lot of time there. So um, yeah, I was actually just talking to one of the techs at our clinic because she really wants to go on a trip like that. So I was talking to her, I was like, okay, I'll start <laughs> putting feelers out again and see if we can do another trip because it's really a neat experience and getting to, you know, I feel like they blessed me as much as we blessed them getting to provide some of those services for them. So that was such a, like, what a great experience. I really, really enjoyed it. That's so cool. Yeah. That's awesome that you got to do that and Mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, maybe go back, maybe help somebody else experience that. Um, Yeah. Their way of herding cattle and working cattle, I've only ever seen videos of, Mm -hmm. um, but makes me um, think that we're, pretty lazy and weak most times <laughs> it's pretty different yeah what we do well it's just yeah it's just such a different I mean they're not out running big herds like we are here and they're not there I mean they eat them but it's not beef animals like here so it's really different and they're just really limited on what they have access to so they just have to make work with you know what they, whatever they have available to them yeah um, which is they're very resourceful but it's what we're all doing, right? When you said, yeah. you know, don't tell them how to work cattle. You're like, you can't do that anywhere. No, so, yeah, you should not yeah. be doing that Whether anywhere. you're in yeah. Naha or in yes. Uganda. It's like, Very true. I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> um, I want to talk about beef really quick because I'm curious as a vet, mm-hmm. um, if you ever get into the position of advocating for antibiotics mm-hmm. and some of these vaccines and things that tend to, some of, some of it's obviously very valid some of it's on trend but in people's concerns about what we're doing to animals that we are gonna ultimately consume Mm -hmm. I think is interesting versus how sometimes people are willing to treat their dog they feel really safe and about treating their pets with some of these things Mm -hmm. but then if we're going to consume it the uh, perspective and the concern is very different and I wonder if you could just speak to that with your expertise yeah that's a great question I do think that the there's such a huge gap between consumers and producers and so I saw that especially when I went back to school I mean it's pretty amazing when you you know here in the county most people have a general idea but you go places where people have no idea how their food is produced and so I understand their concerns um, but you know my perspective it's so hard I have a hard time Um, with some of the programs that have become really popular and not not to criticize ranchers because I think they are just doing whatever they can to make it work for them as a business but um, I have a hard time because I feel like I'm really limited on some of my treatments so you know I might recommend antibiotics but the producer really doesn't want to do it because they're in a program that won't allow that I mean they'll allow them to but they have to pull that animal from the program And I think, you know, if I'm telling them that I think that's the best treatment option and I think that's what's best for the animal, it's a little bit hard to see, you know, we're using it within withdrawal periods. And, you know, if you're using it in in the right way, then that should not, that antibiotic, that drug is not entering the food chain, you know, and they do a lot of testing. I mean, you know this more than I do, but they do so much testing. And so when you're doing things in the proper way, then, you know, we raise our own beef and I eat it. And so, and I am more than happy to use antibiotics on what I'm consuming and I do vaccinate them. Um, And so I think, you know, there's been more studies on some of that than most of the foods we eat. In my opinion, I think that there are way bigger problems in the food world that are not being regulated whatsoever. And beef is not one of them. You know, it's been such a hot topic for so long. So I do think, you know, I I hate to see animals that I consider, I don't know that they're suffering, that's a little bit of a strong word, but they're, you know, they're in pain and they have this ailment and we're trying not to treat them the way that would be the best way to treat them and the fastest way to treat them because 
we're trying to avoid, you know, pulling them from this program or yeah. just some place people just don't want to use it. And I don't, I understand where they're coming from because there is a lot of fear with that. But I also really trust that, you know, if we're using these things in the right way and we're following withdrawal times and most of those withdrawal times are like better safe than sorry kind of thing. You know, they're not doing it like right on the line, like they're being extra safe. And a lot of times, you know, especially in this county, people do a really good job with, you know, like BQA standards. So like making sure injections stay in the neck and things like that or or places where it's not going to be a cut of meat. And so, you know, I think that's like another level of safety in those products. And then same with vaccines, you know, they have withdrawal times as well. But I would much rather know that my animal is vaccinated. You know, they don't need to be quote like over vaccinated like we try to set up programs that you know first of all they're things we actually think they need to begin with but then also you know we don't need to be doubling up on things or giving them more than their body can handle and then again we're following withdrawal times but we're also making sure that they're staying healthy and then maybe we can avoid using antibiotics if we can keep them healthy you know on the front end like we talked about at the beginning you know, that's preventative medicine. You know, it's the same as us vaccinating our dogs. Obviously, they're not entering the food chain, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> But it's the same yeah. idea, right? Yeah, yeah, or ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think as a producer, sometimes it is really challenging. You know, we don't use any anti- antibiotics mm-hmm. on any of our cattle that we're using for beef. Mm-hmm. And and it is, it is a challenge to know when it's okay right. and when it's not okay and making the decision you know, you're caring for this animal, you're in charge of its care, you're responsible for its well being. Mm -hmm. And if it needs an antibiotic to be healthy, yeah, but then that might mean that that animal no longer has a place in your program. And so for us, that means taking it to the sale, right? which may end up in not a great life. Right. For for that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do think that that's really challenging. And the bigger challenge there is how do we communicate to consumers right in in a way that actually gets to them and yeah yeah i think that's really ch- cuz and like you said like your your ranch does that and i know most actually here are in a program they're all really different but they have you know similar something like that where you get to that point where you have to make a decision and sometimes we can sometimes you can you can like go different ways or there's more traditional routes or whatever that you don't have to jump to medication and then other times it's like we just like this is what we have to do or Mm -hmm. they are going to be either suffering or in pain or whatever and it is really hard because every ranch is so different as far as like you said you guys maybe don't have a set some guys have um, a separate program where they'll put Mm -hmm. you know them into that and then they can just run them separately or pull them later however they do it and then other people don't like you said where they'll take them to the sale and it's not always a great alternative so it's really hard to weigh and balance but it is hard because I think the beef industry is so different we're we're driven so much more by consumers than a lot of places or a lot of industries where you know I was talking to a guy one time and he was just like I just have never gotten over the fact that we don't set our prices that and right. it's like one of the only businesses that is like that you know that you're always relying on other people and it's never very predictable you know and I think that's really true and it's especially hard because there is such a big gap between us and c- the consumer so we've been enjoying you know we raise some just a small group and we've been my brother lives in Portland so we sell some to them um, and it's really fun to get to kind of communicate that with them because they have no idea you know it's all new to them and they is we just love seeing how excited they are about knowing where their beef comes from and I know you get this a lot because you guys are really founded in that but it's so cool to be able to tell people and explain why we do things and how we do things and then you know send them a picture of a really happy steer out on a grass pasture you know (laughs) like they just love that and so it's it's I think that I think that it's going to get better with I think that's one of the few things that is going to get better with how big social media is now. I do see a lot of a lot more like ranching and people in the ranching world getting into socials and spreading that word and I think that there's you know that I cannot imagine doing that because I think that's so hard to do and not like you're dealing with a lot of backlash from people but I think that that is how we're gonna start you know I don't know how else people are gonna learn 
you know, word of mouth, you can only do so much. Yeah. Um, especially here, we're really isolated and how much are we actually talking to other people? But I think that that realm is making it really different and kind of bringing a new stage where, you know, even though we're isolated, we can still have a big audience. Yeah. Those who tell the story rule the world, mm-hmm. right? And and I think that's why, you know, if there is um, kind of this shortage in maybe women going into large animal vets, mm-hmm. hearing your story matters and that this is possible and mm-hmm. this is rewarding and this is, you know, something that you maybe shouldn't shy away from or maybe don't need to shy away from um, if it's intimidating and if there is more demand similar to the consumer, they're really the ones with the power. Right. So if there were more, you know, vet students interested in large animal, then obviously they would change their practicals and things to, yeah, to go focus on that. Yeah. Include um, horses and cattle. I think that we're getting close. I want to ask you before we wrap up about being a rodeo queen. <laughs> Um, and the reason why is I know it's something that we both did. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's something that I never thought I would do Mm -hmm. because I wasn't that girl. Mm -hmm. That was my story of it. Right. I'm not that girl. So you talked about hunting and going to the backcountry and fishing (laughs) and being kind of a daddy's girl Mm -hmm. and then being, becoming a rodeo queen. Right. And so I am so glad that I did it Mm -hmm. and, and I totally advocate for it Mm -hmm. to this day. And so I, yeah, I just want to ask you what you thought of it before you did it and what you did after. And then as you've traveled around, if you've ever had the opportunity to tell somebody that your has been rodeo queen Mm -hmm. and that fun reaction. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Yeah. So it feels like it's been a long time, doesn't it? (laughs) It feels like it's been a very long time. Yeah. Definitely the has been crowd for sure. Oh man. Yeah. So I actually almost didn't do it. I kind of always thought I would because I did horse 4-H like all growing up like from fourth grade. I've always been the horse crazy girl since I was tiny. Um, Like I started riding horses when I was four pretty actively. (laughs) And so and my parents never did. So that was new. You know, I was the one that got us into that. Um, As a four-year-old, you were like, I demand we have horses. My first word was horse (laughs) when I was a baby. So I think they knew they were in for it pretty quickly. (laughs) And so, and I think my my dad had always wanted to get into packing. And so I think it was like a pretty easy jump for him to start learning. And then obviously he was a vet at the time and worked on horses a lot. And so um, he knew enough to get started at least. And so we got into it pretty young. And so I did that, you know, I I did 4-H all through, um, And then, like I said, yeah, dad and I used to go ride. Um, And so I almost didn't do it. I was trying to flake last minute. I don't know, probably because I was a teenager and we're hormonal and we're issues. But my dad, again, is the one who convinced me to do it. He really wanted me to. He really thought it would be good for me. And I loved it. I was with Celia. There was only two of us on that year for the Chief Joseph Day's court. Um, And we were like... It was so great. She is awesome. And so we, it was such an easy year, which was really nice. Our parents got along really well. So it was such a, we had such a fun year. Um, and I loved, I learned so much in that, like public speaking, how to just how to communicate with people effectively, um, like how to be in front of people and present yourself. Um, I don't think I had any idea how to do my makeup before then. <laughs> like I was also not that girl <laughs> do my hair. My mom was so frustrated. I, she also loved it. She had a great year or summer, but she was like, I never thought I would spend so much time curling your already curly hair. Like that was just wild to her. And then unfortunately I went on to do Tuckerettes for three years. So, <laughs> so she really had it coming. So my mom had to help me with that every year, but I loved it. I still talk about my experiences quite a bit, especially like when talking to younger girls, I feel like, yeah, I think, <laughs> well, I mean, that's just not, yeah. People have like learned it about me when I've been out and it's just such a I feel like here it's like expected almost if you're right. in those circles, you know, but like when you go other places, they're like, you did what? 
you what like you're waving in a circle as you rode around like what are you yeah. doing they just have no idea that still exists in yeah. the world what? Right. yeah but it's so I thought oh man I gained so much from it like same as some of the like FFA and things I did in high school like all of that was just like career development you know social economics business all of that it's a pretty amazing way you can get out of it and rodeo is definitely that for me I'm still really involved most of the board and like people involved in the rodeo are our clients so I see them all the time um and I just really you know that rodeo is a really big thing for our community um and so it was really fun to be you know they really I thought they did a good job you know telling us you know you are the advocate for this rodeo um and so that's a big deal when you're that age and it's a big thing to do but the you know you step up and do it and a lot of girls do and you just grow like it's amazing to see some of like when you start to finish you know how much more confidence you have and you know ability to interact with people and public speaking is huge for sure and then even like with my horse I gained so much um it really pushed me into you know like I said I did tuckerettes afterwards and that was a huge transition from even from rodeo court to go to that um and I feel like it I it hugely benefited me as a horsewoman you know that's a whole different set of skills you need to have to be able to do that I highly encourage anybody I talk to to do it if it's within reason for them because um, I think it's so great I think there are so many skills to be gained from it and it's fun those memories are so fun to look back on I mean Celia and I still reminisce on some of our fun court stories because you have that when you're traveling together all summer yeah yeah I couldn't agree more I think that I think some of the resistance is the girliness, the like Mm -hmm. makeup, the so much hairspray. Mm -hmm. I think there's less now, but I don't know. So many curls and so much hairspray and glitter and all of that, that, that may not seem like your thing. Mm -hmm. And then just, I think there's this underlying story that girls can't get along, Mm -hmm. right? That if you're going to pit each other, because it is a competition, Mm -hmm. Right. So you're competing to be a princess or a queen, Mm -hmm. which just seems really silly, but it's part of it. Oh, yeah. And there's this there's a story there that that's going to be awful. Right. That Mm -hmm. it's going to be catty and all these things that we learn about being a girl. And for me, that summer was spent riding a horse Mm -hmm. really fast, Mm -hmm. um, signing autographs for little kids (laughs) Mm -hmm. Speaking to people, learning how to represent something that's larger than yourself. Yep. So learning about what that means and how to hold yourself with that level of composure and mm-hmm. grace and all of those important skills. And then you got to go travel everywhere with your friends. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking back, you know, it's like, how else would you ever want to spend a summer as a teenage right. girl, right? <laughs> and and you did have to go door to door mm-hmm. and knock on strangers' doors and try Oof. to sell them something. Mm-hmm. And if you want to try to build confidence in yourself, um, I don't I don't know a better way to do it and push those boundaries. And yep. such a fun summer. I definitely definitely advocate it. <laughs> uh, also comes with a lot of funny. Oh, funny yeah. stories for a lifetime yes um and I think that like, you had a great point I mean there is a lot of like either assumed drama or there can be drama associated with it but I think that you know it's hard for me to speak to because like we just didn't have that our year but we didn't bring it you know like we didn't bring that to the table we were really laid back and you know we were really respectful and tried to do it's basically a job, you know, and you are paid for that job. That's what the ticket sales is about. And so I think that's some skills to learn in itself is learning to be in a team and doing Mm -hmm. it well and still managing to have a good time that carries through. I mean, how many times since then have you been on a team that you didn't necessarily love? Yeah. (laughs) But if you, you know, have a good attitude and you do your best and bring your best self into that, then, you know, that's a great skill to learn at that age, too, because that does not get easy. In fact, it gets significantly harder (laughs) later in life. Um, But it's going to be, you know, just because you don't necessarily either maybe you're not the best of friends to begin with, but you can still, you know, there's a lot of life skills to be gained from that as well. Yeah. How to be in a team. Totally agree. Be a rodeo queen. Yeah. If you have the chance. What's next for you? What are you excited about? 
Who surviving calving season? <laughs> We're kind of <laughs> at the tail end there. right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, well, I just got married last year, so right now, and then we bought a house. Actually, we got engaged, bought a house, and got married within two months. So it was kind of a whirlwind of a summer. Yeah. But we've been loving pouring time into our place. Um, And so that's where I'm at outside of the vet world. And then uh, we're kind of moving and shaking in our clinic a little bit because Dave's retiring this year. Um, So that's going to bring some big changes. Um, So uh, I'm planning to buy into the practice. So that's a big deal for me. So we're looking forward to that transition as much as we're very upset about losing Dr. Dave. That's going to be a huge hit to the clinic. So we're pretty upset about that. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I just I'm feeling I feel like I'm in the groove now where I've seen and done a lot of things quite a few times. So I'm enjoying myself a lot more as a vet and feeling a lot more confident. And I love it makes it a lot more enjoyable just overall where I don't feel like I'm constantly learning all the time. You know, you're, you're always going to be learning. But once you get over that hump a little bit, so I'm in that and that phase right now that era of my vet life so I'm loving that so it's been really fun it's a lot of you know those are some big changes in both my life outside of the vet world and in it and so um, that's been pretty fun and then I've been like I said I did some conferences last year specifically with the beef side and so I'm hoping to bring some of that to the table a little bit now that I'm not in the midst of trying to plan a wedding and buy a house and things like that so yeah hoping to bring some more of that into our clinic um is kind of a you know again it's not a big money maker for us to do stuff like that but I just love um the idea of just being you know full circle for our beef clients and providing some of those things that we just don't have easy access to that out here and so um and it's easier for me to do that where I kind of know everything that they're doing in their program for the most part and like tying in nutrition and things like that is is really interesting so yeah very uh, cool. Lofty goals. But, yeah, you know. good. Well, congratulations on <laughs> all you. of that. You. <laughs> and your era right now is awesome. <laughs> Incredible. Um, and just, yeah, I know that we're just so grateful that you, you did choose to come back and that we're going to continue to have the same level of vets here in this community. And we can't do it without you. So well, it feels good to be supported like by people like you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and thanks for doing this with me today. Oh my gosh. This it was so fun. fun. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. I just want to take a second and thank everyone who's written a review, who has sent mail, who has sent emails, who sent messages. Your support is incredible. And I also love running into you at trade shows and events and just out on the hillside when we're hunting. I think that that's fantastic. I hope you guys keep adventuring as hard and as often as you can. Art for the Six Ranch podcast was created by John Chatelain and was digitized by Celia Harlander. Original music was written and performed by Justin Hay and the Six Ranch podcast is now produced by Six Ranch Media. Thank you all so much for your continued support of the show and I look forward to next week when we can bring you a brand new episode.